Well, welcome to Edibles in the Backyard. So uh, again, as always, we're just going to kind of scratch the surface tonight, but hopefully um, it'll perhaps uh, give you a little bit of interest. And actually, probably many of you are already doing this at home and, uh, and maybe just didn't realize it or did know. And hopefully maybe we can expand your, your knowledge a little bit. And as I was just saying, for those just joining us, um, this is going to be a little bit different these are things that we can actually plant in the backyard and kind of do backyard grazing but my plan is to do like a wild edibles class later in the springtime if, if that's melody that interest you yes yeah i think marie is having trouble here where did maria go okay she might be down your list yeah uh maria i'm not sure about that you might have your mute on your bar at the bottom can everybody else hear me okay i can only see a few of you yes yeah I'm here. i can hear you okay maria just keep playing with it maybe it, maybe you'll figure it out you might need to adjust some settings in your computer. Thanks, Russ. Um, but anyway, we'll do a class on that in the springtime. So again, tonight, just a basic introduction into edibles and what that consists of. And as always, uh, if you have questions or comments, share those in the chat box. And I apologize for last week. I, I forgot about y'all. I, I, um, I was a few days getting that information out to you, but I promise I'll get that out to you tonight or first thing in the morning and, and we'll get the video uplinked as, as well. So uh, just keep your microphones muted and any questions, like I say, pop them in there and we'll get them answered for you. So what exactly are edibles? And I like this definition because it, it does tell us that they seek to retain the existing landscape, but they're integrating edible plants into the design. And you know, I don't know if some of you are like, me but i'm a very visual person uh, but it's hard for me to vision out and kind of imagine what things will look like later you know once they start growing big so it's always handy uh, to put push the pen to to paper if you will but edible landscapes encompass a variety of garden types and scales uh, but they don't include food items produced for sale so that's going to be one of the primary differences so Basically, edible landscapes are just what you're going out in the backyard grazing for. You're not doing it for a commercial use or like a, a, a tailgate market or anything like that. Some associated terms that you'll often hear kind of intermingled or co-mingled, oftentimes synonymous uh, with edibles is organic gardening, permaculture, homesteading, and urban ag. So there's some differences to the definitions of each one of these. Uh, but for all intents and purposes tonight, when you hear these, there's going to be some element perhaps of um, edibles associated with all of these. Uh, they are going to not necessarily be an umbrella term, but they're going to enhance some of the elements that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So as far as pros and cons, uh, one of the big pros, of course, is that we're kind of sustaining, maintaining and sustaining our environment. Um, we're getting to um, maximize water potential, that water efficiency, uh, supporting wildlife, and then also reducing the utilization of chemicals. Uh, some people might have a little bit different philosophy about wildlife, but picture the big picture at hand. So, you know, bringing in bird species, oftentimes even aquatic species, if you have uh, water elements um, in your edible backyard. Um, also, a lot of these plants, you know, hopefully you're going to see some of that. And I've also included in the Google Drive, some of these plants are going to help deter specific wildlife. And you can kind of build your landscape about what rabbits won't eat, you know, and what deer won't eat, that kind of thing. It's just a matter of kind of putting those jigsaw puzzle pieces together. As far as some cons, um, perhaps it's going to take a little bit more time because a lot of the edibles you know, are going to be trees or fruit bearing shrubs. So they're going to take a little bit longer to maximize their full potential. And therefore, they're going to require a little bit um, additional water, maybe irrigation, more watering up front, maybe even for a year or two. 
Um, and then as far as just some of the practices, um, and that just means uh, some of the production type practices. And again, it go, it's going back to the trees more specifically, um, just making sure that um, we're following protocol. And even though we say we're going to reduce the use of chemicals, some folks will still utilize some organic chemicals and things like that. So oftentimes there can be an expense associated with that as well. So what we're going to do in the next uh, several slides is just take a look at some of the, the elements and how we can maybe incorporate some of those. And of course the edible component is going to focus and center around plants, but I've also in, included a few other elements as well. Um, because you know we want it to be pragmatic and practical, we want to be able to wander around and, and graze in the backyard, um, but we also want it to be aesthetically pleasing and you know kind of grow along with us as well. So one of the biggest components, you've heard me already mention that, is is fruit trees or nut trees. Um, you'll see there a quote, there's a saying among old timers that goes the first year sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. And that means basically, you know, once we plant a fruit crop, it's going to take several years before we're actually reaping the benefits. And I'm not a very patient person. Those of you that know me, you know, I want, I want to plant uh, plants for fast or, you know, gratification, uh, strawberries, you know, there's things like that that you can incorporate um, as you allow ample time, really encourage those production practices to, to maintain the health of the plants, um, you know, before we allow them to fruit to their full potential. I know folks that will plant blueberries and want to actually harvest blueberries the first couple years, but, you know, it's one of those production practices. We really want to push that energy, you know, below ground and we want to pluck all those blooms in early spring and that's really hard for some of us to do. But for the long-term health associated, you know, with the trees or even with our overall landscape, it's really beneficial to get into specific production practices with all of these. So let me say here too that hopefully some of these plants uh, or fruit and nut trees as we go through are going to maybe spark an interest. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on the production practices per se, but when you get your evaluation in a couple of weeks, there's going to be opportunity for you to select some of these that we can delve a little bit deeper into as we move into 2021. So again, spark in the interest, but if some of these do pique your interest, make a note of that and make sure you let me know so that can help us plan. Okay, so again, fruit and nut trees. There are so many choices here, probably more within this component than, than any other. So it doesn't matter if you're looking for really large capacity, large size trees, you know, think shade, or if you're looking even for ornamentals to tuck in into a secluded corner. Maybe you want like even um, an, a moonlight or a a sunrise garden or something that. Um, the other cool component about fruit trees, of course, we're working to, to harvest that fruit, but they can also be really pretty. You know, we're going to have those blooms in the springtime. All of these are going to produce a really pretty color in the fall. Nice little leaf show. So just to, again, kind of pique your interest, this is the persimmon. Um, I'll put this one in there first because if you're a University of Tennessee volunteer fan, you can see that that's bright orange fruit. I guess this would go for folks in South Carolina too if you're a Clemson fan or even Auburn. I hesitate to say that. Uh, but this is one that's kind of making a comeback in the region. Um, it's, it's one that you got to harvest just right. You've heard me mention this one a couple of times in the past, but it's, it's got a really nice use. And I don't know if some of you read the agenda. I know some of you didn't get it if you were late coming on or late registering from, from Friday. But there's about 40 recipes that I've shared with you. So a lot of these species that you're going to see, if you've never uh, utilize some of these. Many of you may not have tasted a persimmon or even know what to do with it, but I've included some recipes so you can try your hand. And a lot of these you're going to be able to get maybe at local farmers markets or even I know Ingalls Grocery Store uh, carries persimmons. Um, not all the time, but at certain times in the season. Um, here's the pawpaw or the Appalachian banana. It does make a really fine specimen in, in a uh, edible garden along with a multitude of different cherry trees. Uh, they, there are just so many to choose from, but you're going to be fighting the birds. And sometimes these trees um, can get really tall, depending on what species you have. Um, hence the name for the linemen that drive the, 
the cherry picker trucks because I've got two brother-in-laws that actually do that and um, have been known to go to my dad's and actually use that to pick the cherries. So I, I know where they get that name now. But lots of different um, species of the cherries. Um, nectarines, nectarines and peaches can be a little finicky in East Tennessee. Uh, we actually try to steer our producers away from growing those just because they are so hard to grow. But on a small scale basis, incorporating these into a backyard um, edible garden uh, works really well. What about this one? Kind of a play on words. Uh, jam your backyard full of plums. Because plum jam, that's one of my favorites. I don't know if anybody's ever had that, but um, plums are a really tasty addition. Plus they're a beautiful ornamental specimen as, as well or crab apples. Uh, Ron and I were just talking about crab apples the other day. It's a, it's a really un, unique addition to a landscape. Uh, and again, if you're into preserving lots of different issue, um, things that you can make with the crab apples. Um, pears, they've come a long way in the last several years. So there are some different varieties. Um, I put some cultivar lists for all of these as well into the Google Drive. So make sure you refer to that. Uh, but pears make a, a really great addition. Plus, if you're into the hard cider, uh, the pear equivalent of that is peri cider. It's a little bit lighter in the tannins, a little bit lighter in, in taste, but uh, still yet it yields a really, a really nice beverage. As far as nut trees, um, almonds, we do have some almonds that grow in Northeast Tennessee, or um, as our native Californians would call them, almonds. I had a friend that, um, that I met in Young Farmer several years ago and she informed me she was an almond farmer and it took me forever to figure out what she was talking about because I wasn't about to ask what is a what 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 is an almond but yeah almond almond it's all the same great little nut specimen to be growing uh, same goes with uh, the walnuts you can grow English walnuts or black walnuts of course these are going to be quite large a great edible, but they're going to serve multi-functions, as you've seen me present in the last several weeks. Um, you're seeing some of these again, but again, um, a really good one to add to the garden, uh, to the landscape, but keep it away from the garden. And there also is a um, handout in the supplemental information in the Google Drive about black walnut. So just be real careful with that. Never use that as a mulch. Um, anywhere in your landscape. It, it's not just garden plants. There's also some landscape plants that it can, uh, you can, you can have some persisting problems. So make sure you check that out. Uh, figs, of course, they're going to be a, a really cool specimen. Um, they're a, a great, um, just great on their, on their own. Uh, they can be utilized to really enhance the flavor of many different meals. Um, many different cultivars and species exist on the market today. So uh, there's sure, surely one out there that would, that would suit your need. And of course, mulberries, we're starting to see these grow in popularity um, as well. And pecans, I'm going through these pretty fast because as I promised y'all week before last, I was going to make the last four a little bit shorter. So I'm trying, I'm going to try not to keep you on here all night. Um, Russ kind of already alluded to, I think he was talking about grape nuts and, and have you ever eaten a pine tree? Um, but these are pine nuts, so you can actually harvest those. And I've given you some information on the specific pines uh, that you would need to know about, as well as some resources if that's something that interests you. So truly a fantastic um, nut crop. Uh, the quince, y'all saw this a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, it's a pretty tart fruit, but it yields a really nice pink jelly. Um, but it's also a great accompaniment to, to pork dishes as well. I think that's actually what the, uh, the recipe is. And it's a nice, um, it just makes kind of a nice shape, but you can see there the, the little thorns on the branches. Uh, so you gotta be careful where you plant that in the, in the midst of your garden. Uh, jujubes, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of these. I've, I've seen these before in, at Ingalls, um, but they, they're not native to here, they are native to China. And you can grow these in zones six through eight. You know, they can be a little bit finicky, uh, but they're, they might be something kind of fun to just uh, try. But they're gonna be similar to a raisin or a date as far as their uh, dry consistency. Uh, they're a wonderful little snack. You can prepare them on, on the, you know, just eat them on their own, um, just or just as a dried fruit. Now, I know a lot of people are probably saying, you know, I don't have a lot of room for this. So even if you're small scale and you've just got a little bit, 
maybe of acreage or even maybe just an acre lot, um, you can do espalier. I'm not real good with the whole French terminology, but you can see that this is a fruit tree grown up against the side of a, of a house. So this kind of production does really and truly um, exist. You can manipulate that tree to grow kind of to how you, how you want it to. So if you're lacking on space, there's a, a resource that you can refer to um, in the Google Drive on the espalier. Okay, our second element is companions. So we did a class on this way back, I think in the springtime. So make sure you go back and, and review that because there's so many elements of this element. Well, that was kind of a mouthful, wasn't it? Redundant. But so many of these plants that you can utilize throughout your entire landscape. And, you know, they're, they're pretty. You can see how we've got herbs and flowers and, and greens and tomatoes all commingled together, living in harmony. And we can see that background of peppers there as well. And just a few pictures to kind of showcase that off. Uh, lots of different, again, specimens, but they all are serving as pollinators as well but you're gonna be able to reap the harvest of these as the seasons um, go along. And it just makes for a very striking um, landscape. And especially when you start including some of the hardscapes as well. And to kind of go along with that, what about edible flowers? You know, many of us may be growing some of those companion plants, you know, to serve a purpose in the garden, but we might not always be thinking about um, which ones of those we can actually eat. You can see from this picture here, probably many of these would surprise you that, that are really edible. You know, oftentimes we'll eat the chives, the little green part, but how many of us actually eat the blossom? Um, same way with roses. You know, we often think about rose hips and there's many ways you can pickle those and preserve those, but you can actually even eat um, the petals. Plus, you know, they're going to invite beneficial insects in as well. There's many posters out there that are, that are much larger than this, but this is just one that kind of gives you a sampling. Um, many of you may have peonies or peonies, depending on where you, where you hail from, but uh, they make a, a, an excellent edible flower. Even the marigolds that we use, you can actually eat those. So again, there, there are gonna be some recipes in there for you to, to try. And they just make a, a really pretty addition to any spring, summer, or fall salad. And you can see the violas and the pansies there. Uh, this is cucumber and borage. That picture is a little blurry, but you've heard me mention uh, borage before. It's an annual plant. Uh, one plant's all you need. It'll reseed itself very prolifically. It's got these really nice star-shaped flowers that are blue or white, but the entire plant is edible. Um, and it tastes like cucumbers, which is what we see it pictured with here. You can also see the borage flowers here. Very delicate taste, not too overwhelming. Uh, we can also utilize um, nasturtiums, which are gonna have like a peppery taste. So it's almost gonna be like your greens that you use in your salad, but the flowers are gonna be giving it a little bit of an enhancement. And let's see, oh, the calendula flowers are what the really skinny ones are. And you've heard me mention that one. You're gonna hear me mention calendula in a couple of weeks when we talk about home remedies. Um, but this one is one, again, you're gonna get uh, dual efficiency for. And I like that. Uh, many of you have heard me talk about capers coming from nasturtiums, and I guess I've been kind of wrong about that. You, you, you do, but it's what we call a poor man's caper because the true caper comes from a caper plant, and they look just a little bit different. But you're going to treat these just like you would caper. Uh, so again, it's just called the, the poor man's caper. Um, you're you're going to make utilize these seeds that are still firm. They might look like they're a little bit soft and rubbery there, but um, they're going to be firm and they're going to be really crisp, really tanger, tangy, have that lemony-like citrus zest. And of course, uh, a pretty simple one there are the sunflowers. You can utilize these in about every corner of an edible garden. Uh, they're really cheap and inexpensive, a great plant to get started with. And many of these you can actually save seed from year to year. Uh, one that's very similar, actually in the same family, uh, this is what we call sunchoke or Jerusalem artichoke, and you can kind of see what the root of this plant looks like 
in growth stages down here at the bottom once we would harvest that. Uh, but they truly do taste a lot like an artichoke. So again, you're gonna have a really pretty pollinator stand that you're gonna be able to, to utilize uh, the root of that for food. These will grow really rapidly too and they spread really fast. And often, oh, also on the sunchokes, a lot of people will re uh, replace potatoes. Um, same texture, same consistency there. Uh, this is one, we, we had a master gardener that grew this um, plant, the hibiscus tea. A uh, really unique little specimen. And then of course rose hips, I've already talked about the roses before, but there's um, a couple of resources in there about the multiple uses because we could probably do an entire class just on the edible flowers. So kind of taking it a step up from that, you've heard me talk about vertical gardening before and trying to get everything growing up, but uh, when we did that class back in the spring, we talked primarily about vegetables, uh, especially our cucurbits, anything that had a vine on it. Getting it up off the ground, uh, giving a little bit more airflow, it was gonna be healthier in the long run, um, less disease pressure and that and especially um, insect pressure so that kind of thing so here within the edibles think about your herbs being in a vertical space uh, this one here on the left is actually suspended on the inside of someone's house so many ways that you can get creative doing that have your own little kitchen garden um, and this is i'm not sure what they're using here but a pretty cool little specimen garden just for herbs and you can see how that's stacked and it takes up less space. Um, other ways that you can incorporate this, just some cutesy type things, utilizing um, old blue jeans and a two by four or those shoe um, mesh shoe containers. Lots of different ways that you can can grow your herbs. You know many of um, many of those herbs can just be propagated by cutting, simple cuttings and get them started, even rosemary even as finicky as it is, will usually take pretty quickly. So just a few more pictures there. Um, again, some of these might be a little bit more elaborate, more expensive. It certainly doesn't have to be that way. I have some of these at home and I don't, I mean, they're not anything fancy like that, but just something kind of simple that you can utilize. Uh, one picture I don't have in here is the gutter gardens. Uh, you could also grow strawberries and different herbs and gutters on the side of a shed or yard barn or anything like that as well. So um, again, takes up a lot less space, pretty much utilizing every niche of space that you've got on, on your property to do these. But if we're wanting to take it a notch up, one way that we can do that is include access paths. You know, when we talk about growing our vegetable gardens, we'll talk about mulching, but we don't talk about anything that is going to be static and in a location um, permanently, I guess. And you can kind of see from this picture, uh, these beds are gonna be in place, probably even this one too, but they've actually created a little walkway. Cause again, it's just kind of adding some visual appeal. Um, this one's just using uh, rock and stone. For those of you that uh, came to the spring wildflower walk, you saw my natural rocks behind my house, you know, utilizing something that's already existing to be able to include this works really well in a setting like this. You know, gravel and wood chips, those are going to be excellent, um, you know, for, for any kind of bed shape, but take this, like this one here, like a circuit, uh, just bricks that they've utilized to make like a herb ring or an herb spiral, uh, just to kind of give a little bit of a contrast and, and utilizing the flagstone pathway. And they've got plants that are planted inter, intermingled throughout that entire pathway. So still utilizing a lot of the space. Just a simple plank board um, walkway and you can kind of see how the, the garden's encroaching there. It's just kind of natural to that environment. But if you have an edible landscape, one of the reasons that we incorporate this element is because you want it to be um, a grazing path of sorts. Um, you don't, you, you want to know where everything is. You don't want to be trampling on, you know, specific plants. So you're going to have to have an access, you know, path to be able to, to reach your plants and kind of build off that um, on an annual basis. 
And again, something really simple here. This kind of depends on your, um, on your preference. So when we talk about these access paths, a lot of times we're going to have structures or places that we can include the elements of fruit vines. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit more boisterous. Uh, they can kind of get out of hand sometimes. Maybe unruly is a better term. Uh, but you can see here the reason I chose this picture is because a lot of people will just use like a, a pad, a fenced-in paddock, or a little lot that you have an existing structure already in place. And you can actually use that to grow vines on. Um, you know, the caution would be there to make sure you keep those vines trimmed back and, and proper or follow proper pruning and production uh, practices to maintain the health of the fruit, but also um, so your, your fence wouldn't rot there. But you can see here they've actually built a, uh, a trellis, a very nice trellis to be able to support the grapes. And they've got some companion plants planted here as well. So this would be if you're wanting to, um, to start an edible landscape and you want to include some of these fruit vines, remember that as you're planting because this is something that's going to require a little bit more space. You might have to create a structure for it. So don't neglect some of those type plants that are going to take um, a little bit more planting to, to include those. Uh, muscadines or scuppernogs, um, these are growing in, in popularity. Uh, they make great wine, um, kind of, well, it is our only native grape, actually, to the United States, but they are, um, they grow prolifically, much more so than any of our um, other great varieties and cultivars do. So, again, this is one of those that's going to require a lot more space. So, before you choose, you know, choose which one of these uh, varieties, make sure you, re you refer back to some of those extra materials in the Google Drive, um, because this one can really, um, I, I would say it's the kudzu of the grape world, actually. It grows pretty fast. Uh, the passion flower, which is Tennessee's state flower, um, this is a really nice addition. It's pretty. Uh, you can utilize the fruit. It's just a cool plant. Um, it's one of those that tells a story in, in the landscape. And um, if you're trying to hide something even unsightly, that's another thing that these vines can help you do. Uh, we all have those little locations in our yards or on our property that we're like, oh, I kind of wish I could hide that. Well, this, this is one of those plants that can do that for you. As well as um, raspberries, the black raspberries, remember we've got different kinds, even the yellow ones, even the white ones, and then we've got um, blackberries. And we have so many of all of these caneberries cultivars that are being tested now, too. Um, it's just really cool to see some of the research that's on the horizon. So as you're planting an edible garden, really keep these caneberries in the back of your mind because they can really add a lot of pop uh, and serve multi-functions in your, in your edible landscape as well. If you trellis these cane berries, so that's the key. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that you can trellis these or that they really need to be because all of our cane berries are going to be, um, they're going to have pressure for like powdery mildew and some of those fungal pathogens. And if we can get some more airflow in there, then it really reduces that pressure. And again, that's going to help us reduce some of that chemical spray. Um, here's one maybe some have not considered. These are the hardy kiwis. I've never grown these. I'm not, um, I don't even know anybody that has, um, but I've, I've researched and I've heard that um, this one's come a long way. You can kind of see there that it's on a trellis system similar to how we would do grapevines. So this is one I'm going to research a little bit more. As I find things, I'm going to pop that in the Google Drive. I'll let you know when I do. Here's the choke cherry. A lot of people uh, see this and, and think um, that it's pokeweed. There is a difference between the choke cherry and the pokeweed. Um, the, the Native Americans, we'll go back to them, they love this plant. They love choke cherry. Um, and this was one of those that was renowned uh, with all Native American tribes in the US and Canada, all the way across um, into those Western tribe. So a lot of different uses for the choke cherry. This is one you not heard me mention um, very much, but the Cherokee really liked it. Um, they said you could take the bark of this tree and boil it for about 15 minutes and it made a great um, tea. You can actually pound the seeds 
into like a coffee, very similar to what you would um, chicory. And then as the settlers migrated into the area, they used it for jams and jellies, tonics, um, syrups, um, all kinds of good stuff. Wait a minute, there was one more thing I was gonna say there. I put a note in the section here. Yeah, the best time to collect choke cherries is middle August or mid-August into early September. And caution you here because often the fruit will look like it's ready in July, but it's not. You gotta leave it, gotta leave them on the vine. Um, another little snippet here, um, blackberries, we often want to pick them when they're shiny. Don't do that. Wait till they're dull. They've lost that sheen, they've lost the luster, and that's actually when they're truly ripe. So if you don't learn anything else from tonight, remember that. Um, kind of moving along here, containers. Again, this is something we focused on um, many times in past classes, uh, but we can also utilize containers in our edible landscape as well. And you can see here just a, a mixture of flowers. All of these are edible. Um, they're just a striking, um, accompaniment to to any garden just some different ideas here again it's going to be a lot like some of those vertical um, trellis systems it's just a matter of preference kind of what you've got growing but anytime you upcycle or recycle you can come up with all kinds of really uh, creative locations for plants again if you're you know low on space um, of course these metal uh, feed troughs, water troughs cost a little bit of money up front at the co-ops and things, uh, but if you don't have space, they're a good investment. You can maximize your yield. You can get, you can pack a lot of, of fruit and a lot of herbs. You can see the different plants planted in there, so uh, you can still be quite successful planting in the containers. You can see here just a uh, Kind of chose this picture for two reasons, because we can put a squash in a container, but then it's got a nice little contrast as well. And then again, this is just in a corner. You can see some bamboo that's utilized back there. Um, they could even, with that structure in place, even grow some like passion flower or something. We don't see that on here. Maybe even that hardy kiwi, uh, but different elements that you can incorporate into a small corner, kind of tucked away. And they've used um, some color to just give it some pop. And to kind of go along with that too, um, garden structures. This is a water bath kind of just sitting in the midst of the access path there. Um, but again, when we are building these edibles, you know, it's not always just for us. We're, we're supporting the, the pollinators, the butterflies, and the birds, and we, and we want them to have a safe haven to come into as well. So raised beds would also be um, a, a component of that. You can see just some tables and tires, some pots that are all incorporated. Um, some kind of rock structure back here. I don't know if that was created or if that was already there, but you can see a lot of different um, structures that are all within this landscape. Uh, lands or raised beds don't always have to be wide. You can see how they've made these a little bit more narrow to fit their small space. And again, this is separate. This is not growing on this fence that we see back here. But you can see they've got a trellis system here with some like cattle panel, hog wire. <clears throat> uh, but even on that fence, they could get creative and, and do some, some vines, um, fruit vines or the, some of the shrubs. Uh, we can see some shade trees all built in here. And as this continues to grow, it's just going to, again, kind of grow with them. Uh, maybe something a little bit more elaborate. And kind of see how that's utilized, but a lot of, uh, again, containers in place here. Arbors, pergolas would be another example of, of one of those structures. Um, incorporating some of the elements of, of rock or brick or any kind of stone. Again, it's something to match, um, you know, your, your personality. And then as you're incorporating some of those structures and trellises, again, as you're kind of visioning out, um, remember about your borders creating uh, some striking visual borders that are also going to serve a dual purpose. So um, another thing to think about here would be cover crops. Um, I don't think I have any pictures of that in here, but even utilizing some of those green covers in the summer like buckwheat uh, would be a really pretty edge um, to include or again um, any of those edible flowers. You can kind of see how they framed their vegetable garden in 
y'all can tell I'm trying to talk with my hands and I'm trying to use my mouse. It's, it gets frustrating sometimes. <laughs> Uh, when, you, when we talk about uh, borders again, you can kind of see how they've used some of the allium species here. They use some lettuce species here. So um, this, this could be the front yard, the front entranceway of someone's home. And, you know, to us, it's, we know that it's edible, but to, you know, Joe Q Public maybe, or the UPS driver delivering a package, you know, he may or may not recognize that everything in here is, is functional and serves a purpose and can be eaten. Um, right out the front door. And just some more pictures there to show you, uh, kind of doing some intermittent planting with uh, marigolds and different greens. This one's a really pretty one of the anis hyssop mixed in with uh, green beans. Makes a really striking feature. Uh, sometimes the hyssop will be called agastache, but again, dual purpose plant. Scarlet sage, up until just, what, a week ago, this was blooming beautifully. Uh, if you um, have hummingbirds, they love this plant. Um, if you like color later into the year, this is one that won't bloom until probably late August or maybe even into September. But it's um, a really nice plant. Um, the pineapple sage, it is a member of the salvia family. There's many different species there. Uh, Mexican sage, um, it's got a purple spike and it's like a velvety filling flower, but it's beautiful kind of intermingled and you get some late season color with this too. So really pretty uh, border that um, the butterflies will feast on late into the season. Again, when we talk about um, including those structures, think about your raised beds. Uh, they don't all have to be straight and in one little corner of your garden. Uh, you can see here how they've even got some triangles shaped beds included so they've got this little square space but it to just glance at it it looks like they've got more space than they really do um, but again it's just a matter of personal preference um, these are a little bit higher um, as we get older maybe some of us get into some back trouble so this is going to prevent us from having to bend over quite as far and maybe even uh, recycling some wood that we might even have on the, the property again remember that raised beds are not just for veggies that's often um, the angle we approach it from but you can utilize raised beds in various um, in various ways um, throughout your edible landscape you can see herbs pictured here. Um, I've showed you some pictures of flowers. So incorporating again all those elements um, into your garden. Strawberries love raised beds. Um, it's one of the, well, again, it's going to be one of those fruits that you can reap the benefits, get, you know, get a harvest that first year, which is why a lot of folks like to incorporate those um, into their edible landscape. And this is one that you can kind of move around from year to year. You, you know, you might have a a raised bed with strawberries for three years, pull those, plant something else, and, and replant your strawberries somewhere else. Uh, blueberries actually will uh, do really well in a raised bed setting too. You can see here just one plant per box. Um, the reason that a lot of people will go that route is just because of the pH issue. You know, we preach that all the time. You know, we got to have that pH low, down to a 4.5. So this is one way that folks with small space can include blueberries in their planting. They can, you know, modify that soil in those cubes and call it done. And then what about rhubarb? Um, some of those plants you've heard me mention before that, that take up a lot of space, the perennials, um, asparagus, rhubarb, horseradish, all of those come to mind. You know, you can include those in raised beds or again, even plant those in pots um, throughout your landscape. You just kind of want to keep keep those um, confined a little bit, or otherwise they do kind of tend to take over. Uh, your perennial herb gardens, we've talked a little bit about growing herbs vertically, but don't, and, and then we always think about our cooking garden, but don't neglect the perennial herbs. Um, you know, remember, remember what those are. You know, when it, when it comes to mints, you just heard me say, can find some of those plants to pots, but maybe that's something you've got the space that you can plant a mint species and let it go. Um, like I said at the beginning of class here, I had been working in the yard and I've got peppermint um, 
the back door of my house and I didn't realize just how much it had sprawled and taken over because I've got it planted in the ground but you talk about just fabulous the the, the fragrance you can go out on the back deck and smell that all the time it's just it's just very lovely so if you had the space let it serve as a ground cover um, you can mow over this repeatedly too and it'll still come back so it's it's pretty pretty tough pretty uh, resilient and you can utilize mints in so many different ways um, again these perennials you know kind of dedicate um, dedicate them or dedicate a bed to the replacement um, not to say that you can't come back and intermingle some annual plantings with them um, but remember that these are going to take up a little bit more space they're going to continue to grow um, you've also got some plants that, go, that are going to be biennial like your parsley so remember those two when you're placing because you're going to have to replace those every couple of years and you can kind of see there um, this is beautiful so to the you know the normal person driving by they're going to look up there and think wow they've planted some pretty flowers you know but we all know there's so much more to that so much more um, than what any normal passerby would see here because everything's being utilized from the trees uh, to the flowers and you can kind of see they've a little snippet here of how they've got an access path included there here again you can kind of see how they've created their raised bed incorporated all these perennial herbs but when we're when we're thinking about doing um, all these edibles don't neglect color you can see color a color splash back here black-eyed Susans um, I'm not sure if there is an edible use for those or not but don't forget about color you, you know you you still want to have a little bit of that in there uh, but this is this is just your color look at the multitude of color there so when you are kind of laying out a design to some people that may not matter to some of you, you may want to have color throughout the season just like you would in a normal landscape and you can achieve that with an edible garden so even if we're 100 percent pragmatic you can still incorporate these basic elements um, i've put a color wheel in your google drive I, I couldn't get it to fit on a slide that you could read i guess i should say but it's going to take you through that color wheel and you can kind of see i don't have the headings at the top but the different colors um, that you want to achieve what you can achieve it with and it kind of gives you a description of that plant so you know if you're wanting a red violet plant red basil or you even notice that plum is on the list so it's going to include your trees as well and you can kind of see some of that here um, green for lemongrass and you can see that bright burst of color there with switch little bit of swiss chard you know a lot of our vegetables are going to add um, add interest even though we're going to be eating them they're still going to be pretty um, throughout the season or think about all those uh, colored peppers that we grow you know we can even grow some of those peppers up or put them in containers and kind of showcase those because we're not really harvesting those until august or september um, we've got some cold crops kind of intermingled in there with various different colors um, I have heard, and this is included in, in your Google Drive, but you don't want a lot of one specific color because it can be, you know, the stop sign effect. So be, be cautious with that. And again, you can just see that different color contrast. And again, the cool thing about all these, I mean, everything you can utilize, everything that you see in these pictures. And then our last element is just taking your entire front yard, you know, sewing the lawnmower and turning it in to a, an edible landscape. You know, it, it doesn't have to be confined to that backyard. That's what we always call it is backyard edibles. But, you know, uh, completely uh, redoing your entire landscape. And you can kind of see how this is at the front entrance. You can see the, the driveways here, probably a, a townhouse or in an urban environment but they've included many of the elements the 13 elements that we just talked about um, and look at that small space they've got lots of color everything is going to be utilized same here this is probably one that's just getting started and so they've got a lot of mulch but this is something they're probably going to continue to grow uh, you can see how they've got trellis support system already in place 
So this will probably be a lot of those mining plants we were just talking about. And then just some more pictures there to show how that, what that looks like. So some pretty cool um, pictures just to kind of see how you can transition into an all edible landscape. So just a few more plants to think about that I didn't really have in those pictures, but I definitely think are worth a mention. Um, artichokes or cardoon. Uh, it does take up an enormous amount of space, and this, this picture here doesn't really show you, but um, if you've never grown it, it can be kind of prickly. The leaves can be. Um, some people would even consider it um, invasive. But the cool thing about growing cardoon is that uh, most animals aren't going to want to eat this, so it makes a really good border plant if you're trying to deter some pests. Um, you know, you don't, you don't really want um, nothing touching these growing anything close. Um, any of our, our bean species, again, we think about these being in the vegetable garden, and, and they are. You can utilize those, of course, but you can also trellis these. Uh, they have a really nice color contrast, so don't don't forget those as well. Beans are going to be very versatile in your edible landscape. Peppers, I've kind of already mentioned those. Uh, so many different uses for a multitude of peppers. These little, um, I forget what these are called. They grow these the plant cell. Good, goodness gracious. But these don't get that tall. They don't get that big, so you can actually use these as a border uh, plant as well. Don't forget your mushrooms. If you are really into mushrooms, and this is another one that I want to do a class on maybe in the spring, but you know, there's what, like 15 different kinds that we can actually culture and grow in our backyards. So when you're planting this, don't forget that. So even if we're planting those big trees or our shrubs, you know, kind of uh, keep your mushrooms in mind if that's something you want to get started because um, They'll, some, of, some of the varieties, not all, all of them, are going to require a little bit different environment. So just, just remember that. Um, if you want to jump ahead, I've included um, a handout on the mushrooms. It's a really cool resource if you're interested in growing these. Don't forget your dandelions. Uh, you can use dandelions for so many different mechanisms, different things. Um, and we're really going to spend some time on this in a couple of weeks when we talk about um, herbal remedies. Purslane, um, many would consider this a weed, but it does serve a purpose, and it does yield a pretty uh, flower as well. And um, if you're looking to uptick your calorie intake, purslane will really do the job for you. It's, got, it's very dense in calories, so if you're trying to lose weight, don't eat this plant. Uh, what about the oxalises? There's different colors of this, the uh, yellow, and the white or the wood sorrel. That's what often we will uh, refer to this, but vitamin C, this is a plant that has a tremendous amount of vitamin C. And if you boil this plant, um, it will taste like potatoes. That's maybe one green I could get on board with. Um, if you like a really tart lemon flavor, uh, sheep sorrel is an excellent um, choice there. It's going to add a lot of flavor. Plus, it's really cool to utilize in, in bouquets too. You can see that down there at the bottom. Cattails actually are edible, so if you have a pond or a wetland on your property, don't, don't forget the cattails. Um, you can actually boil the, the, the brown flower, the stalk that you see here, and actually eat it like corn on the cob. And you can also eat the rootstock, and it will continue to prolifically reproduce itself. So, you know, again, it's going to be kind of like borage. You know, the borage reseeds itself. This is one, get one plant, and it's just going to take off and do its thing as long as you've got that wet environment. Uh, we talked a little bit about amaranthus in the past, uh, saying, you know, the, the pigweed family. Uh, and you can see there, it, it is a pretty spectacular specimen if you want to add that uh, to the edible landscape. It's a pretty tough plant. If any of us, of you, have, I know I do, I'm saying us, because I battle this weed every year in my garden, not the true amaranth that I'm trying to, to harvest and utilize, but uh, it's a tough plant. It's, it, 
pr can pretty much grow anywhere. But um, many cultures around the world will, will utilize this, saute it in stir fries. Um, you can harvest the, the tiny seeds and um, mill it for grain. Um, some of the different species would be, this one I think is Love Lies Bleeding, which is a good specimen, green tails or uh, red leaf. And then of course you can also utilize it in a salad. Uh, you've heard me mention black elderberry in several of the other classes, so don't forget the elderberry to make your um, elderberry syrup, your cough syrup, your flu tonic. And again, it's gonna add some contrast to your landscape throughout the seasons. Just be careful when you're consuming this. You don't want to, um, you know, you want, you want to know what you're harvesting. So always be, be careful with that, whether it's in your backyard or if you're wild foraging, always, always know what you're consuming. Uh, this is the Sarvis berry or Sarvis berry. It's got a lot of different names, the Saskatoon berry. Um, I think there's some other names I can't remember, but this again is one of our native species and it's not just a tree we see growing in the Pigeon River Gorge. It actually does serve a purpose, so it can be included um, in your edible landscape. Um, it can get pretty tall. It does grow pretty fast as compared to some of our um, normal landscape trees. And as far as um, species, there are a lot of the cultivated varieties that have come along in the last few years, so you can get um, different fruit sets. So if Sarvis berry is something you're interested in, uh, there's a couple of links included in the Google Drive that'll kind of hopefully help point you um, in, the, in the right direction. Like I said, um, well, there's 38 right there. You can see at the bottom, Sarvis berry pie. So if you've never had Sarvis berry pie, you're gonna have to make sure you harvest some of those next year. Uh, but lots of different recipes in there. Um, I hope that I hear back from some of y'all if you try some of these. So we're kind of running the gamut. You can see pizzas, you can see margaritas, uh, fritters, pesto, lots of different things on there. So hopefully it'll kind of suit everybody's need. I've not tried all these myself, but I'm looking very forward to doing that. Okay, so like I promised, I was going to get y'all out of here earlier for the next for classes. I don't know what time it is, but yeah, I've not talked quite as long tonight, y'all, so I, sh I should get a gold star for that. But again, hopefully um, this is maybe piqued your interest in some of these cool plants. Uh